Hi, my name is Trinity, and welcome to Kids Talk Church History, a -a one-of-a-kind podcast where kids investigate the history of the church. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Has he kept his promise? How has Jesus built and preserved his church against all odds? Come with us on a trip through church history to find the answer, here on Kids Talk Church History. Around 596, Pope Gregory of Rome, known as Gregory the Great, sent a group of about 40 monks from Rome to southern England to evangelize the Anglo-Saxons who lived there. Augustine of Canterbury was the leader of this group. However, this mission almost failed before the monks could even cross the English Channel. During their long trip, they heard such terrifying stories about the barbarous Anglo-Saxons that they were ready to turn tail and run. Augustine went back to Rome to ask Gregory if he had considered all the facts. He begged him to reconsider, but Gregory encouraged him to continue on. To help the missionaries, he sent letters to the kings along the way to make sure they would provide their support, and Augustine and his men landed in England in 597. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Kids Talk Church History. My name is Lucy. I am 16, and I live in San Diego, California. My name is Lucas. I am 15, and I also live in San Diego, California. And I'm Linus, I'm 12, and I also live in San Diego. Augustine of Canterbury was one of many who brought the gospel to people who had never heard it. In another episode, we talked about Patrick of Ireland, who was the first to go outside the Roman Empire with this very purpose in mind. Augustine's trip was another first, the first mission sent by a Roman pope. Just to be clear, this is not Augustine of Hippo, the one we introduced in another episode. Right. At that time, people didn't really have last names in the same way that we do now, so we often distinguish them by a place where they were born or where they lived. This Augustine is known as Augustine of Canterbury because he set up a mission in Canterbury, England, and became the first archbishop there. As fearful as they were, Augustine and his men must have felt relieved after they arrived in Kent after hearing all the horror stories, because the local king, Ethelbert, allowed them to preach. Yes, although the king was very cautious at first, which I can definitely understand. In those days, most groups of people tended to believe the same thing when it came to religion. Praying to the same gods was a form of unity, so kings didn't want to upset the balance too much. And unlike today, people were usually skeptical of new things. According to the early English historian Bede, Ethelbert told Augustine, Your words and promises are very fair, but as they are new to us, I cannot approve of them so much that I forsake what I have so long followed with the whole English nation. But then he was convinced. He was baptized and gave the mission his support so that thousands of people were baptized too. And that's why he's often considered the first English Christian king. Although it is very interesting that he said, your words are new to us. He must have heard of the teachings of Christ from his wife, Bertha, who was a princess from France and had married Ethelbert on condition that she could continue being a Christian, and had even brought with her a bishop, Ludhard, as her pastor. He had even given her an older church to use for her worship, so this was not all new to him. But we will talk more about Bertha in an upcoming episode. So maybe Bertha was the first apostle to the English. Well, it's pretty difficult to say who was first. Remember, when we learned about Patrick of Ireland, his family was Christian, and that was almost 200 years before Augustine. In fact, there were still plenty of Christians in Western Britain, but in Kent, Christianity was almost forgotten. Not completely, but almost. On a separate note, I wonder why those names have gone out of fashion. Ethelbert sounds very kingly. Yeah, I hope we can do more episodes on Christianity in England, so we'll be able to hear some more of these names like Ethelberga, Athelstan, and Ethelred. They are very fun to pronounce. (laughs) But I don't see them coming back in fashion anytime soon. Well, I'm sure we'll talk again about Christianity in England in future episodes, but right now it's time to take a look at our mailbox. First, we have a question from Miranda. She said, I am wondering about one of the first Christian martyrs, Perpetua. My question is, how did she become a Christian? Thank you for writing, Miranda. As usual, we will turn the question to our guest, who will join us in a few minutes. In the meantime, dear listeners, keep sending us your questions and comments to questions at kidstalkchurchhistory.org and enter to win a book. Today, we are giving away a copy of Simonetta Carr's Church History, courtesy of Reformation Heritage Books, where you can find lots of information about early medieval missions in the church. Again, that's questions at kidstalkchurchhistory.org. You can also find the link on our website. 
And now we welcome our special guest on today's podcast, Dr. Ed Smither, Professor of Intercultural Studies and History of Global Christianity at Columbia International University and author of many books on church history and missions. Dr. Smither, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's my privilege. We'll start with a question from our listener, Miranda, who asked us how Perpetua became a Christian. Now, I saw that you wrote an article about Perpetua and on her friend Felicity. Perpetua wrote about her experience as a martyr, but did she say how she became a Christian in the first place? We don't know exactly. Um, in uh, what became what was called the Passion of Perpetua and Felicitas, uh, it includes part of her diaries. Um, and she doesn't actually say, but that's not terribly unusual because where she lived in North Africa, in uh, she died in the year 203. In fact, yesterday, March the 7th, is the day um, that she died. Mm-hmm. And we remember that day, like we remember March 17th is St. Patrick's Day, March the 7th is St. Perpetua and Felicitas Day. But um, we don't really have well-known famous missionaries. It it seems that many African Christians at the time were sharing their faith. And uh, But what we do know is Perpetua and Felicitas and five others were arrested because they had asked to be baptized and, and they had violated a law that had been passed uh, the year before in North Africa. So, um, so we don't know exactly how she came to put her faith in Christ. All right. So moving on to our discussion that we just had, you heard us talking about uh, Augustine of Canterbury. Uh, did we make any mistakes in our discussion or leave out any important details you'd like to bring up? No, that's that sounded really good. In fact, um, I, I, I would just add that Bertha was probably the key witness to her husband uh, for many years. And I think some of the kings of France who were already Christians helped Augustine and the the monks to to get across. It was a dangerous journey, but um, that sounded really good to me. Thank you. Uh, We often think of missionaries as these kind of uh, fearless Christians who are willing to risk their lives for the gospel. But uh, as we can see with Augustine of Canterbury, that isn't always the case. Um, Do you have any other stories of missionaries who were uh, afraid of the people that they were supposed to evangelize. Well, sure. Um, yeah, it happens a lot more than we think. But uh, I think about uh, in the 13th century, Raymond Lull was uh, a missionary who came from uh, uh, the island of Mallorca off of Spain. And he was going to North Africa. And he had been for years and years training other people and training them in language and learning about uh, Muslim culture and Arab culture. And and then it was his opportunity to go. And I think his bags and everything were already aboard the ship. And he kind of chickened out and said, I, and, and just kind of freaked out and said, I can't do this. Um, but he ended up actually later going on two, uh, three actual uh, mission journeys to North Africa, uh, well into his 80s uh, when he died. Mm. Yeah, I think those Augustine and the one example you just provided are just uh, great stories of how missionaries aren't, you know, all fearless. They're humans, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, back to Augustine, uh, I said earlier that uh, his mission was the first to be commissioned by a pope. Uh, What was the significance of that? Well, uh, Pope Gregory was... Uh, I, I think what's really important there is there, there's a story that he would go down into the slave markets in Rome and he would see um, boys with blonde hair and blue eyes. And he said, who are these? And they said, well, these are the Angles or the English. And legend says that that he had kind of a play on words. He said, well, I, I wish the Angles would become angels. Uh, I wish they would become children of God. And uh, later, this was before he became the Pope or the Bishop of Rome, um, and later he would send the mission team uh, to make good on this promise. Um, Probably too before uh, Gregory was Pope, he was leading a monastery, and they were often uh, purchasing boys out of slavery and taking them into the monastery and educating them. And so, uh, so he seemed to have a real burden. That was his own personal burden. Um, I think the second thing is just that whenever missionaries go out, they need to have authority and accountability. 
um, that's really important. And I think in the case with uh, with Gregory and, and Augustine, he was their authority. And what you said earlier about uh, Augustine came back, he was they were scared. He didn't give them the chance to come back. He said, no, you you have to keep going. Uh, but he wrote some 18 letters encouraging them, uh, you know, in their work and giving them wisdom and instruction. So um, so this was important. That was very interesting. I've definitely heard that story before. And I know that there were some other missionaries around there at at the same time. Can you tell us about some of them? Yeah, one of my favorites from uh, a little bit before um, Augustine of Canterbury was a guy named Columba, who came from Northern Ireland and um, went across the cold uh, North Atlantic Sea to what is now Scotland. Um, He, like uh, like Augustine, first made contact with with, uh, a Scottish king named Brydius, um, shared the gospel with him and asked him for favor and permission to preach the gospel among, it was a, a tribal people called the Pictish people. Um, and so uh, so they did that. They set up their monastery on an island called Iona. And then they would go and on preaching trips. Um, one of the things that I really like about Columba and the monks at Iona is that they really connected with the art of the, of the Pictish Scottish people. So the Pictish people had these big stone monuments um, and when they became Christians, they started to make big crosses that you see. Sometimes we call them Celtic crosses. And so what what we see is someone who connects with the art and the culture of the people that they're going to, to be able to explain Jesus to them. So today we we would use the words missionaries and mission trips, but what would they have called them at that time? Yeah, that's a good point. The word mission or missions doesn't show up in church history until about the 16th century. So like you you mentioned St. Bede uh, in his book or some other historians, they, they called missionaries things like wandering evangelists or wandering preachers, itinerant preachers. And for the, for the monks that came from Ireland, the Celtic monks, they just sometimes just called them pilgrims. And so they were pilgrims who went out on journeys and preached while they were on their pilgrimage. That's uh, that's very interesting. I never knew that before. So I also wanted to ask, how much preparation would it take to prepare for a mission like that at that time? Well, uh, because they were monks who were committed to prayer and um, praying together daily and reading the Bible and also working with their hands I would answer that, that they were really preparing for much of their lives. They were preparing for years. Um, it's hard to know, like when when uh, when Pope Gregory sent Augustine, we don't know exactly if they had three months or six months. It's probably not as quick as our trips today, but um, but there were definitely uh, there was definitely preparation in their spiritual lives, uh, but also just what it took to to uproot their lives and move to a new place. So, uh, like you said, traveling back and forth like Augustine uh, took a lot of time. Even their mail was slow compared to today. These missionaries had to have a lot of patience. We're used to doing everything so quickly nowadays. Like just today, I texted my mom, when are you coming home? She replied in five seconds. Uh, So how can we learn patience from these missionaries? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think from from their lives, they they were people who spent a lot of their day in prayer, and um, they spent uh, you know time even in silence. They spent time outside, and so um, I think a good lesson from them would be maybe to practice a whole day away from our phones and screens and computers and TVs. Um, the Celtic monks, especially, love to be outside in nature. They would go on on prayer walks. Um, and so we read about this in their writings. And so, um, so I think this is a good thing for our, for us today to, to disconnect from our technology and, and learn to be quiet. And I, and I think that does help us with our patience. And then is there, uh, anything else that we can learn from these early missionaries? Well, I think just from even kind of what we said, I think that they, you know, they, they spent a lot of time each day praying, um, 
they they spent a lot of time learning the word of god uh, but they also did other things like fasting and denying themselves and so they were preparing themselves for hardship and suffering and so even though they were scared they wanted to come back to rome the fact that they had been almost like athletes um they were spiritual athletes they had trained they they were ready and prepared for a very hard and difficult task so i i think that they um they prepared for hardship and suffering through their disciplines and 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 through their preparation well i know you already mentioned columba of northern ireland but of all the uh, other missionaries that you've covered in your books do you have uh, a favorite or maybe two yeah, how about I give you two? Uh, first one would be a man named Timothy of Baghdad. He was a bishop uh, in Baghdad, which is now Iraq. What I really liked about him is, number one, he sent missionaries. as a, He was a pastor, so he sent missionaries to Central Asia and China in the 8th century. But he lived in the city that was controlled by what's called the caliph, or the global leader of, of Islam or Muslims. Um and in the year 781, Timothy and the and the caliph, the Muslim leader, had a really good dialogue about what Christians and Muslims believed. And Timothy did a very good job answering some hard questions that Muslims had. And I think um, I really admire him. Uh, one of my second favorites is a man named St. Francis of Assisi, who is from Italy. And what I like about him is not only he lived a very simple life, he was also a monk. And though he grew up in a rich family, he he gave away his wealth and lived a very simple life. Uh, but during the middle of the Crusades, when when the church in Europe was fighting with Muslims, um, he went uh, to Egypt to be able to be a missionary to Muslims. And um, what I like about him is he was a combination of being a man of peace. People liked him. Uh, but also boldness in sharing the gospel of Jesus uh, and 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 tackling hard questions that a Muslim would have. So so I like those two guys. So uh, some of your books, like mi- missionary monks, would you say that they're simple enough for teens and preteens to be able to read and understand? Uh, sure, you you guys could read that. Um, Probably a better book I'd start with is a book I wrote called Christian Mission, A Concise Global History. Um, I think that would be a little bit more, it's a little bit broader. It's it's more than just about monks. And um, I I would probably start with that one. Well, Dr. Smither, we have, we only have two more questions for you. And these two questions we ask all of our guests and they are, what got you interested in church history and what suggestions do you have for people like us who want to learn more about church history? Yeah, well, well, for me, when I was in middle school and high school, my favorite classes were history. And, and then once I got into college, um, I majored in history. Um, and then later, when I went to, to a master's degree in seminary, I, that my focus, kind of my major there was, was church history and mission history. Um, so, I've just always been interested in kind of knowing about the past, but I think for me, what's most interesting is is meeting very interesting people like St. Francis or Timothy or or Augustine and and learning about their how they were innovative and were creative and were were kind of ahead of their time with with ideas. Um, so that's what got me into it and keeps me into it. Um, you know, f- for for you guys, I would just keep doing what you're doing. I mean. There's a nice website called the Biographical Dictionary of Christian Missions. Uh, Boston University hosted. It's it's online. And there are nice little short articles about all kinds of cool people. Um, So that's a really cool place to start. And then at the end of each short article are books and articles and other things. So if you want to dig deeper, uh, you can. And so um, so I encourage people to, to check that out. Uh, Thank you for your advice, Dr. Smither. I also, before we wrap it up, I have a few uh, questions about your your personal life. So I've read that you have uh, three kids. I was just wondering, uh, how old are they and do they listen to our podcast? Uh, I don't think they listen to your podcast. My kids are 19, 17, and 15 years old. So my son is in college. Uh, My daughter's a high school senior. My other daughter's a high school freshman. But but I will tell them about this podcast and I know they'll 
die to to listen to it since their their dad who's so cool is on it so (laughs) (laughs) that would be awesome Uh, i've also read that uh you like cycling um can you tell us a bit about that yeah well i i guess kind of like celtic monks i just love to get out on the open road and (laughs) It's, uh, I used to run, but now I'm old and my knees and ankles don't allow for that. So I just love to love to get out and pedal and, and, uh, go out on country roads and it's, it's good for the body, but also just for the mind too. I usually just do that in the spring and summer and early fall. Uh, it's a little, little cold in the winter, uh, to do that. So I usually like cycle indoors at a gym in the, in the winter. Well, Dr. Smither, we are all very thankful that you decided to spend this time with us and share your knowledge and to answer our questions, both personal and church-related. But our time, sadly, is over for today. So maybe uh, in a future episode, you could come back and tell us about some more missionaries in the Middle Ages. Their stories are just so amazing for all of us to hear. And again, to all our listeners, make sure you visit our website, kidstalkchurchhistory.org, for the opportunity to win a copy of Simonetta Carr's book, Church History, which was chosen as Best Children's Nonfiction by World Magazine. Our website is also where you'll find all of our podcasts, special offers, news, and more. And don't forget to tell your family and your friends where they can find us. In partnership with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and on behalf of my co-hosts, Lucas and Linus, my name is Lucy. Thank you for listening to Kids Talk Church History.